Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here again. It's the third time. I feel very uncomfortable, I must say, uh, following uh, a rhetorical genius like Erwin Kotler. But I also feel uh, uncomfortable because uh, I have to surf in 14 minutes, 45 seconds through 40 pages of text of a carefully argued argument uh, that goes quite a bit against what uh, Mr. Wei Xiong Chen said, namely that terrorism cannot be associated with any religion or what the Saudi ambassador to the United States, which just gave the UN a hundred million dollars, said terrorism knows no religion. But we heard it this morning from one of our speakers that ISIS tries to implement almost by letter what Islam did in the seventh century. Well, you can say that is jihad and that has nothing to do with terrorism, but uh, the situation is not as easy. So I run it through a couple of PowerPoints when I see the PowerPoint machine, yeah. But first, a couple of general remarks. We have seen, after a period of growing secularism for much of the second half of the 20th century, a rise of the influence of religion again, because uh, perhaps greater devotion to religion goes uh, in hand in hand with uh, growing existential insecurity. Globalization has brought people uh, from different cultures and regions uh, and religions in closer contact, and that has rather than a greater understanding brought greater friction. We have also seen the decline of certain uh, isms like uh, communism or nationalism, and possibly that has been compensated by the rise of uh, religion again. There's also the widespread perception that politics is immoral and public life desperately needs uh, the sacred cleansing of religion. Uh, religion has always had a special appeal to people, especially the masses, uh, because it claims what no science can do, solve the problem of death. Whether we like it or not, uh, secularization theory, the notion that modernization with its emphasis on universal education, rationalism and scientific inquiry leads to a broadening of the enlightenment process and to a shrinking of the importance of religion. It has been proven wrong in a number of countries. Religion is on the march, march again. The general rise in religiosity has been accompanied by a parallel rise in religious extremism, as nearly every mainstream movement uh, tends to have an extremist uh, fringe. Yet where is the borderline? What distinguishes uh, normal religious beliefs and practices from violent manifestations of religious extremism? We have seen that uh, peaceful religious devotion has uh, turned to intolerance and fanaticism in a number of uh, countries. And uh, if you look, for instance, at uh, terrorism as a manifestation of uh, extremism, we clearly see that uh, a certain type of religion, uh, Sunni religion, has many more such uh, terrorist attacks witnessed than others. If you look at the quality of, for instance, just a small category of terrorism, suicide uh, terrorism, which was uh, started by <coughs> The Tamil Tiger is not openly a religious group. We see that uh, almost five times as many people get killed by fundamentalist uh, groups. If terrorist attacks are taken as a major expression of religious extremism, it is striking that uh, terrorism worldwide occurs uh, mainly in uh, Muslim-majority countries or countries with uh, strong Muslim minorities. So 
you might find some of you might find it strange that Israel is not on this list as a target, but the figures uh, refer to the year 2013 before uh, the recent onslaught by Hamas. Religious movements uh, turn more often than not against each other, but also uh, against the state, uh, especially when the state ties itself to one particular religion at the expense of others. Conflicts involving religion tend to be more uh, intense and often longer than other types of conflict. I just would like to share with you a uh, page from the U.S. State Department Religious Freedom Report for 2013 that makes clear that millions of people are forced from their homes on account of their religious beliefs, one of the largest displacements on records. Religions like to portray themselves as a force for peace, and internally within the group, indeed, uh, to the extent that people obey them and that it is enforced, we see uh, that there is a lot of internal peace, not necessarily harmony, and there's a, usually a price to it, uh, namely freedom. But on the other hand, we see it in Central African Republic, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in Syria, in Iraq, there is tremendous quarrel. Religion, I said it before, is on the rise. By 1970, about 80% of the people claimed to follow a religion. Now it's close to 90%, and if things trends continue, it will be uh, even more in a couple of years. Is this a welcome development? If you believe in democracy, it is not. Leonard Weinberg, a Jewish scholar at the University of Nevada, has observed, and I quote, that one of the long, most long-standing findings in the study of politics is that the more religious people become, the stronger their objection to the democratic way of life, uh, a democratic way of thinking. And this is, of course, especially true for Islamists who believe in that sovereignty rests with Allah and not with the people. Well, what is extremism? Uh, I find a very good starting point, Manus Midlaski's uh, book on political extremism, where he looks at both left and right wing communist and fascist extremism, and that's how he uh, defines it. Well, uh, how about religious extremism? Midlaski calls uh, the distinction between secular extremists and those who base their actions uh, on sacred scripture more apparent than real. That can mean two things. Religion, religious extremists are, if you scratch below the surface, like secular extremists fighting for resources, influence, and power, and using uh, religion only instrumentally as a mobilizing device. However, the more I looked at it, the more I find it's the other way around. Uh, if you scratch a secular extremist, you often find a, a religious undertone. Uh, that is perhaps uh, more evident to most uh, of us if we look uh, at uh, if we look at right-wing extremism. Extremism is often portrayed as this is, for instance, from uh, the German representation as something at the edges <laughs> and uh, while radicalism is still within the German constitution if you go further to the right or the left uh, you are at the end but there is also a horseshoe model of extremism where uh, the opposites touch each other le contraire se touche uh, and there is much to be said for that. Uh, Hitler said a good commun a communist can always make a good uh, Nazi, but a social democrat can never make one. So uh, if we see, and some speaker yesterday referred to it, what happened in the demonstrations against uh, Operation Protective Edge in the streets of London, we saw 
Islamists from the British Muslim League marching hand in hand with right-wing neo-Nazis and left-wing as from the Social Worker Party, all united in their anti-Semitism. So uh, there is, I think, uh, it doesn't need much explaining that between right-wing uh, uh, extremism and religion extremism, there are links. But I was amazed to find in a wonderful study on the Italian Red Brigades by Alessandro Orsini, uh, as the title of the subtitle of the book says, The Religious Mindset of Modern Terrorists. And he finds uh, and documents it very well that the world uh, of these left-wing extremist terrorists uh, was populated uh, with infected presences, I quote, that attack the purity of the elect, uh, the revolutionary vanguard. The last day is near when evil people will be punished for their misdeeds. Such an apocalyptic view really comes close. I see my time is running, so uh, I really go through. I try to make a working definition of religious extremism, which I will not read to you. But uh, what we have to do, I think, is to be politically incorrect and look at uh, religious uh, movements the way we look at uh, some other movements. Uh, I don't want to go into the details between uh, religious manifestation and terrorism, but the idea of sacrifice of something innocent, innocent civilians, or the terrorist who himself considers himself innocent, and religious sacrifice, there are certainly parallels. Uh, of course, a lot of nuance is requested here, and I don't have time uh, to uh, go into uh, that uh, nuance, but what I would advocate is that we monitor extremist movements uh, just as carefully as we others. And as the previous speaker said, uh, I tried to develop some indicators uh, for that. But as the previous uh, speaker said, uh, anti-Semitism is a problem. Uh, we have the Anti-Defamation League that uh, monitors extremist uh, anti-Semitism in the world, and we need such an instrument for all sorts of religious extremism. Well, uh, coming to a conclusion, uh, I just want to uh, give you some take home advice. I did a study uh, recently for the International Counterterrorism Center on uh, violent and nonviolent extremism and found that the differences between uh, two are more a question of opportunity and impunity. I also did a study on radicalism and radicalization. And looking at radicalism, it has a quite different intellectual history than extremism, and not a bad one. Uh, if you look at 19th century radicals, they were anti-monarchist and pro-democracy, they were anti-clerical uh, and uh, liberal, they were for women's rights. So uh, I think uh, radicalism is not a bad thing in itself as long as it's open-minded and pragmatic and reformist, which extremism, unfortunately, is not. It is closed-minded, and uh, as one Salafi said, a Salafi only lists, listens to another Salafist. So we have to find, fight that mindset, and that mindset has to be fought online and offline, in schools, on, on the internet. And uh, for that, a major effort is needed. Uh, my first book on terrorism was called Violence is Communication. Violence has been fought uh, in terrorism uh, kinetically for a long time, but we still have not put full weight on the fight against extremist ideologies that are the breeding ground for terrorism. So I would... Uh, suggest to you that we uh, concentrate in the future our fight more on the hearts and minds and that uh, we use the internet as skillfully as the other side does 
and schools of communication, students, they could all make this part of their online educational practices. And I think we cannot afford to leave the internet to the other side. We have to win it back. Thank you for your attention.